I chase a rabbit for just a moment based on that? Uh, anybody ever wonder when they sing that song, it says, here I raise my Ebenezer. What in the world does that mean? Here I raise my Ebenezer. Any, any of you Bible scholars out there, Hebrew masters figured that? Well, it's a combination of two Hebrew words. Eben, which means stone, and Ezer, which means protection. Here I raise my stone of protection, which is Jesus Christ. So um, there you go. Now that's worth the price of admission right there. Isn't it? <laughs> So you'll notice I have a little more light on me. My uh, videographers back there have told me that the, because the screen's so bright for video and for those people who couldn't make it, it makes the, um, the makes me too uh, dark. So uh, we got a little bit more light this morning. I hope you can take it. <clears throat> We're about to go into the second installment of our multi-installment History and Heritage series. And you'll notice that 2 Timothy 3.16 is there. And if you have your Bibles, you can open to 2 Timothy 3.16. And I will uh, take a moment to read that from the Word of God. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. I want to highlight for us this morning this phrase, God-breathed. What that is translated from, it's translated from the Greek, which is theonoustos, Theonoustos, one of those compound words in Greek. And theos means God, and noustos means to breathe out. And so what it means is all Scripture is God breathed out. Now, why is that important to us? I would put to you that it's important to us because many people say, well, there were lots of guys who wrote the Bible and they had their own problems and Paul didn't like women and, you know, different people had their own agenda. And so you can take some of that stuff that was written, uh, but not take other stuff. Let's call that out. Let's mark some of this through because we don't like it or understand it. But what Paul is saying here is it's not that God inspired or breathed into those men and it was kind of a mixture of what they thought and how they, their opinions were that was breathed into Scripture. No, it's theonoustos. It's God breathed out all of these Scriptures, all Scripture, as something that is useful for rebuking and correcting and teaching and training in righteousness. And so this is what we're studying. We're studying our history and heritage of the scriptures. We need to know these things. We need to understand that God has had a plan all along for his children. And as we understand that, we understand better what our future is. I want to just give you a little saying. Of course, most of you know that um, Bob and I, back in our youth, were in the Marine Corps. And so this is a great saying that's a memorial tribute to the Marines at Iwo Jima. Being aware of those who have gone before and the sacrifices they made connects us to them and sharpens the awareness of the responsibilities we have for each other. Those who are strongly connected with their history feel a sense of place that makes them less likely to throw away their future. Amen. Thank you, Brother Marine, back there. Uh, so I think that's important for us to sort of let sink in. That 
that we understand about the richness of our heritage, our American heritage, but even further back than that, our biblical heritage and the veracity of our scriptures, the more we hold on to the future because we have hope for the future because that plan is the plan that God has had for us. Now, who knows what this is? Anybody know? I know it's a stone, some of you characters out there. But what kind, what's, what's the name of this stone? Well, I don't blame you if you don't know. Because you only see it about once every 50 or 60 years. And sometimes it's even hidden then. This is called the Stone of Destiny. And this Stone of Destiny is placed underneath the coronation chair of the kings and queens of England. This is an older picture of the coronation chair so that you can see, see right down here underneath the chair seat? That's that stone of destiny. It's always placed underneath there when a king or a queen of England is coronated. And you can see it's pretty heavy. It's got these lions that are at its corners. And so there it is, the stone of destiny. The new monarch sits on that stone as they are about to be crowned. Last time it was used was back in 1953 when, 52 or 53, somewhere in there, when Queen Elizabeth II was coronated. See, she's sitting on this chair, but because she's a lady and she has a dress on, you can't see the Stone of Destiny, but all the British know that the Stone of Destiny is under there. And that's her destiny and their destiny to be uh, king or queen and theirs to be subjects. So I use that as a little bit of an analogy because I want to build a little bit of a thematic here for the next few lessons that we're going to go through. Uh, you see these lions down here. There are four lions that hold that chair up with this heavy stone plus the monarch on it. And if one of these, can you imagine if one of those lions comes loose or is not there, what happens to the coronation stone? I mean, and the coronated person. They're going over, right? So what I'm going to use is this is our stone of destiny as we each have a destiny under Christ as church. We need to understand that there, just like there are four strong lion legs underneath that stone of destiny, we have our four imperatives that we need to know to keep ourselves in the seat as Christ has made us brothers and sisters, under God, adopted children, prince and princesses in his kingdom, we need to understand the reality of the record, the integrity of the content, the continuity of the true church throughout the centuries, and the illumination of the Holy Spirit. Those four things will give us a firm foundation on which to sit our theology and so as we're going to go through, we will see this over and over. You've got that as a slide in your uh, bulletin. So we're going to talk today and a little bit next week uh, about the reality of the record. So do you have your seat belts on? Are they fastened tightly? Are your tray tables upright and locked? That was for our brother Robert uh, there, that, uh, the Mr. Pilot. Um, why is this important? Why is any of this stuff really important? If somebody were to ask you, you know, I understand that Bible is your thing, your people of the book, but, you know, that's an old book. It's, it's antiquated. You can't even read it in some translations. And so why is it important? Because Christianity hinges on Bible veracity. The Bible is his story as well as history. And if there's no Bible, there's no anchor for our behavior. It's just no standard for living but my opinions at the time. And that's what we have a lot of uh, in our society today, right? Everything is relative. 
And so, you know, your truth may not be my truth. And my truth might not be your truth. And so uh, I'll go with my crowd and my truth. And if my crowd is bigger than your crowd, then you'll have to bow to our truth. Do we see that some, in some of our society today? The teaching of our pastors from the content of the Bible is mere platitude if it's not history, if it's not proven, if we don't have any foundation and documentation of it further back than King James maybe. So we need to understand the veracity of our scriptures. It's important. So what is Holy Scripture and why does it matter? Jesus said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. And I'm going to, this is going to be kind of heavy on words here for a few moments, but it's, these words are pretty darn important. This came from the advice of the Assembly of the Divines back in 1646, which is called the Westminster Confession. Some of you all who uh, have been in the Presbyterian Church or uh, some of the other uh, church, Church of England, you will notice that uh, the Westminster Confession is an entire booklet explaining the theology of the church. And some things they got really good and most things they got really good, but what we want to concentrate on is just this right here. The whole counsel of God concerning all things necessary for his own glory, man's salvation, faith, and life is either set down in Scripture or by good and necessary consequence may be deduced from Scripture, unto which nothing at any time is to be added, whether by new revelations of the Spirit or traditions of men. Okay, so what does that mean? Why would they come up with a statement like this? What got into them? Well, what got into them was there were a lot of people in that day that were saying, oh, I have a new revelation from the Lord. And here's my new revelation from the Lord. And you search through the scriptures, you don't quite find it. Uh, you might find a, a little half verse here or a little half truth there or a little Old Testament saying around the corner. Uh, but... They're getting a new revelation that doesn't jive with the continuity of Scripture. And that can lead us astray. And that was happening back in the 1640s when they wrote this. And I'm not sure that it stopped since then. Then you have traditions of men. Well, that was the Roman church. The Roman church said that the tradition of all the leadership of the popes and um, what they call the magisterium of bishops and cardinals, all of the things that they said were the traditions of men and that they were just as important as Scripture. Whatever the pope said was just as important as whatever the Bible said. And so that, they called that their traditions. So what the Westminster Confession um, Anglicans were saying back in those days is, no, Scripture is what you need and all you need and no new revelations that don't go along with and aren't put forth as a continuum of Scripture, not a few verses cherry-picked here and there, and not the traditions of men. So, next one that's a little bit uh, wordy as well, but important. And we're going to get along with a lot less words in a few minutes. But the doctrine or message of Scripture, which alone is infallible and inerrant, is hidden in the historical and cultural witness of the biblical writers. There are no errors or contradictions in its substance and heart. It bears the imprint of human frailty, but also carries the truth and power of divine infallibility. Because of the superintendence of the Holy Spirit, we have in the Bible an accurate portrayal of the will and purpose of God. And that third one is really important. The others are very important too. But, you know, it says, uh, this is Donald Block who wrote Essentials of Evangelical Theology. And 
Uh, he uh, really was able to get things, uh, very tough subjects, down into good review. And what he says is not only it has no errors or contradictions in substance and heart, and it's divinely infallible, but even though 40-some-odd men wrote it over many hundreds and indeed thousands of years, the Holy Spirit of God, the third part of the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, actually supervised all of that as God breathed. So when you hear people saying, well, some of it is right, and you know, we believe in Jesus teaching, but beyond that, you know, we can't really get into it and you shouldn't believe that stuff. Well, they have a right to their opinion, but you have a right to yours as well. And you need to be apprised of the fact that we have decided as Christianity what the truth is that we will believe. So here's where it's going to get it really exciting. Less words, more interesting stuff. The Old Testament canonization parameters were this, the content of the 22 Hebrew books, the law, the prophets, and the writings. Now, where am I getting into trouble already? Where am I getting in trouble already? Yeah, there are more books. How many books are there in the Old Testament? 39. Thank you, sir. And so I'm saying the content of 22 Hebrew books. Well, I'll get to that in a minute. Put that on the shelf just for a second. Let's go down here. New Testament early church canonization perimeters are that it should be apostolic by or authorized by an original apostle or relative of Jesus Christ. Early first century writing closed in about 99 AD when the apostle John, the last of the apostles, died, or as I like to say, crossed over into heaven. And orthodox, a unified and recognized teaching traditionally accepted by the majority of the early church and patristics, that first generation beyond the apostles, as inspired by God. And so these were the, when it came to the time, you'll hear many people say, well, a bunch of guys got together, a bunch of uh, holy men got together in the third and fourth centuries, and they had these councils, and they argued, and they finally decided and came up with that, but it's really a bunch of men that got together and decided to put that together. Yes and no. It was a bunch of men that went by certain parameters, and these were the parameters. Apostolic, early, orthodox. In other words, they, these are things that they had been learning and knew from the first century. Now, I'm going to go back and answer that question about the Old Testament. It's really 39 books within the original Hebrew 22, right? It's all the content that we have in our Bibles today. So, some of you all can exhale now and relax because it's all of that content but in the original Hebrew 22 books. And here's the way that worked. Um, all of these 12 minor prophets in the original Hebrew Bible, they were just called the prophets. And they were all in one scroll, all in one book. So this was one book. And then... Um, 1st and 2nd Samuel were just the book of Samuel. 1st and 2nd Kings, book of Kings. 1st and 2nd Chronicles, book of Chronicles. You see how that goes? And some of them were paired up with each other. Um, Esther went with Song of Solomon. Why? Because the women each year gathered at the temple during the time of the feasts and they read Song of Solomon or Song of Songs and uh, Esther at the same time because why? It was precious. Those were precious and, uh, and, and relatable to women. And then the men were going through um, Job and Proverbs and Ecclesiastes at the same time to get their lessons that more were toward men and what they needed to do in life, you know? Remember Proverbs is, is always starting out uh, in many chapters, my son listened to my teaching right? And so this is the way they did that. But suffice to say that 
all of these we still have. And it's great to have this as our um, bellwether for history and that God has always had a plan and that plan was coming along and that there are lessons in morality from the Old Testament. You'll hear some preachers today say, we don't need the Old Testament anymore, we just need the New Testament. Well, I, I beg to differ. We need the Old Testament. It's a prequel to Christ and we're going to look at that a little bit. And then 27 books from the original Greek is the New Testament. And so Hebrew is a pictorial language. It's a language that there are a lot of stories and the stories stick with you because it's pictorial. And uh, they loved their language. They still love their language in Jewish circles. Uh, but we do too when we can go back to the original Hebrew and pull up those picture stories, which we'll do a lot in the future as we go through some of the Old Testament that we're going to study through. But Greek is an exact language. Now, why, is, why, did it, why didn't they just make it simple on us and have one ancient language that we have the Bible from? Why not all Hebrew? Or why not all Greek? Well, in the Septuagint, we do have all Greek because that was the Greek um, Bible, Old Testament, and then coming up to the New Testament paired with that. But the Gospels, which is the life and work of Jesus Christ, and the Acts, the life and work of the early church, all the Pauline epistles and the other writings of the New Testament needed to be very exact. So if you went back to the original Greek, there's no problem verifying exactly what those words meant. We'll talk a little bit more about Greek as we go, go along. And here's an interesting thing. I'm going to hurry through this, so don't let me lose you. All right? So look at this. 22 books of the Old Testament, five books that are central, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts, and 22 that are remaining. So what do we have? 22, 5, and 22. Guess what? The center of the Bible is right here. The center of the center is what? John 1, 1 through 18. How does that start? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All the way explaining about Jesus Christ to the 18th verse, which says, and he came and dwelt among us. Right? That is the center of the Bible, right there, content-wise and volume-wise, for 22, 5, and 22. So, we can look at it this way. Everything in the Old Testament is pointing toward Jesus Christ. Everything past the Gospels and Acts is pointing, even past the Gospels, is pointing back toward Christ. So the Old Covenants are pointing toward Christ, and then we have the New Covenant in Christ. And so you might look at it a little bit like the Old Covenants are the prequel to Christ. The New Covenant is the sequel to Christ. And Quell, where we get Quell, Quell here, is the source the pre-words about the source and the sequel to the source. Does that make sense? So let's look at the Old Testament. We're going to bring up the Old Testament here for a minute. And this is something that many of you, most of you probably have never heard because you haven't studied the Jewish heritage of the rabbis and much of their writings. But when you do, you'll find that there's this thing called the Hezean of Scripture. They call it the sanctified completion of divine revelation. Now, this is for the Jews talking about the Old Testament. So it's the sanctified completion of divine revelation, right? Now, you'll see names here. Adam, Methuselah, Shem, Isaac, Levi, Amram, and Moses. And they're in a chain. What that means is, there are only six word of mouth or diary transfers from the origins to the written Hebrew of history. Only six generations. Let's see how that worked. 
you had these diaries that came along during these times as links that were strong in the chain for writing. But Adam and Methuselah, according to the Bible, lived 246 years at the same time. The first 246 years of Methuselah, Adam was still alive. Well, do you think you could pass on a few stories about the in the beginning and what happened and how far it got to Methuselah if you had 246 years to do it? I think I could pass on a few of those stories quite a few times. Methuselah shared the earth with Shem for 98 years. Shem shared the earth with Isaac for 50 years before he died. And so these all shared the earth and the stories and the leadership of the Jews all the way through to Moses who wrote down the Pentateuch. Isn't that neat? Only six word of mouth with diaries for the whole Old Testament. And so people will say, well, man, that was so old. We, can't, we don't know who did what or what happened. Or, well, the Jews do. They called it the Hazan. And that's a whole other story. Plus, some of you all have seen this. I spoke about it uh, when I was first here. The ancient documents confirm hundreds of specific dates and actions in the Old Testament. We have all of these different kinds of documents that have now been unearthed and have been analyzed, and they prove over 2,000 things that the Bible says happened. I think it's 2,039 things that they've gone through, and these documents correlate to those things in the Old Testament. So these were pre-Moses to 100 B.C. And then after that, we have the Dead Sea Scrolls. And we talked about this a little bit. The book of Isaiah is virtually identical with what we have today in the Protestant Bible. So um, all of these different manuscripts, if you look at the book of Isaiah, I mean, that's a pretty big book, right? And it's pretty important. It's got a lot of words in it. And yet, with seven exceptions, and almost all of those are little grammatical exceptions, nothing changes anything doctrinally or to make sense. We have in our Bibles today something that was written 700 years before Christ. Almost exactly. And so are the other books. Then we have the Hinnom Amulets, and we talked about the Hinnom Amulets, those of you who were here for that presentation, and how we have the Aaronic blessing from 700 B.C. And this was unearthed in Jerusalem, just outside of Jerusalem, that says, Yahweh bless you and keep you, make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you, lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And we have had that read to us many times, and it's been uh, put on many plaques and on many uh, items of Scripture and uh, things that relate to Scripture. And these were found in Paleo-Hebrew from 700 B.C. It's just like that in our Bible today, except it doesn't say Yahweh. It says God, which is the same thing when you translate it into English. We have the Nas Papyrus, which is from the second century, about 150 B.C., um, and it's a papyrus fragment written in the square Hebrew script containing the Decalogue and the Shema. And the Nash papyrus was the oldest biblical text known before the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. But we've had that. And then you'll remember, some of you all who may have been here, the New Testament certifies the Old Testament. There are 320 Old Testament quotations that are in the New Testament. Quotations. There are over a thousand clear references to the Old Testament in the New. Every one of the New Testament writers refers to things that occurred in the first 11 chapters of Genesis as though they were true. Jesus referred to Adam and Eve as real people. He referred to Noah and the great flood. He accepted Daniel as a true prophet. He regarded Isaiah as author of all of his writings, and he accepted the writings of Moses as historical and inspired. Now, if you're going to say we only like the New Testament and Jesus and what he said, this is what he said, if you bother to read it. 
And Jesus said, All things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. So you got Moses, the Pentateuch, the prophets, major and minor prophets, Psalms, that's all the writings is under Psalms of the rest of the New Testament. I mean Old Testament. And so, closing out, what we're going to do next week is we're going to look at New Testament and where there are New Testament documentation that we have that goes back to the first century. And we're going to find that 5,000 plus New Testament fragments, and by fragments I mean parts and pieces of whole books, so much that you could put a whole Bible together just from all the fragments from the first through the fourth centuries. And they were found in this area that we're going to study next week in part three. So this is a fragment, and we're going to look at that one, and we're going to look at some of these places where these evidences of the record were found. So the reality of the record. Now, do we know a little bit more than we did know about the reality of the record and how we can say to other people, hey, I may be from the country, but I'm not a bumpkin. I know these things. I've studied these things, and you should study them too, and maybe you'll come to the truth. So this is our help for our witness. The reality of the record will continue next week, and then some of we'll get into some of the integrity of the content for our foundation together. So if you have come today and you wanted encouragement for your Christian life and for your Christian walk and for your prayers, I think you can be very sure that you can pray thanking the Lord for giving you more information that gives you that firm foundation under your coronation chair. Join with me and pray to the Lord. Father, we thank you for bringing these facts to life for us so that we might worship you and realize the clarity of your plan and your documents that have been brought down to us and that are in our Bibles this very day. And help us, Lord, to take that witness to our neighbors, to those that we work with, those that we love that might not have this information, and help us to show the love of Jesus as we go about it. And it's in his precious name that we pray. Amen.